on this Monday night, grief and anger. Israel's prime minister faces unprecedented pressure to finally secure a hostage deal with Hamas. The nationwide protests and scathing criticism from critical allies. ERSOS. Five emergency rooms in BC forced to close this long weekend. The problem and potential solutions. Losing local journalism. If we don't have that information, how can we be a functioning democracy? The unsettling news this Labor Day about more layoffs in Canadian media. Plus, breaking moves and barriers. It's kind of surreal to me. I get recognized on the street and stuff. The Canadian Olympic champion sweeping a new generation of dancers off their feet. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Israel appears at a crossroads after six hostages captured by Hamas on October 7th were found dead early yesterday. Israel says they were murdered just moments before Israeli forces could reach them. Today, a funeral was held for one of those victims, 23-year-old Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg Paulin. His family described their heartbreak after holding on to hope for 11 agonizing months. Here's what his mother had to say. Finally, my sweet boy, finally, 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 you're free. <laughs> I will love you and I will miss you every single day for the rest of my life. That grief is mixed with anger across Israel. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis took to the streets again today, marking the largest anti-government demonstration since October the 7th, blaming Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for failing to secure a deal to bring the hostages home. That protest included a national general strike. Workers walking off the job, bringing much of the country to a halt. As Redmond Shannon reports, Israel's international allies are also showing their frustration. And a warning, some of the images in this story are disturbing. Anger and exasperation outside the home of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Coming on the day of a nationwide general strike, those on the streets calling for a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas to release hostages held in Gaza. Israel's labor court ordered it to finish early due to it being seen as political. Their anger triggered by grief for the six hostages whose bodies were recovered from a Gazan tunnel Saturday. Israel says they were shot by Hamas shortly before Israeli soldiers reached them. On Monday night, the militant arm of Hamas released an unverified video of killed hostage Edin Yerushalmi. In it, she called for a hostage deal. We don't know when her statement was made or whether it was made under duress. On Monday night, Netanyahu asked for forgiveness for the hostage deaths, but insisted on staying with his strategy of eliminating Hamas to free those still being held. He still very much sees this as a sort of epic power of wills, uh, as really embodying the overall struggle between Israel, Hamas and the broader uh, regional enemies that Israel has. That strategy being questioned today by Netanyahu's main international ally with one stinging word. Mr. President, do you think it's time for Prime Minister Netanyahu to do more on this issue? Do you think he's doing enough? No. Netanyahu bristling in response to questions about the U.S. president's criticism. These murderers executed six of our hostages. They shot them in the back of the head. The pressure internationally must be directed at these killers, at Hamas, not at Israel. There is also new international pressure from here in the UK. Britain's foreign secretary says he is revoking some of the arms export licenses to Israel because of the risk components might be used to commit or facilitate a serious violation of international humanitarian law. Jeff? Redmond Shannon in London. Thanks, Red.
Meanwhile, the suffering in Gaza continues. The Hamas-run health ministry says at least eight people were killed in Israeli strikes today, hitting Gaza City and a refugee camp further north where people were reportedly buying bread. Just yesterday, 11 Palestinians were killed in an airstrike on a school sheltering displaced civilians. More than 70 percent of school buildings in Gaza have now been destroyed, according to the U.N. Those airstrikes come despite Israel and Hamas agreeing to pause fighting in some areas to allow for a mass polio vaccination campaign. The enclave recently saw its first confirmed case of the disease in 25 years. So far, the World Health Organization says more than 80,000 children have been vaccinated. Medical staff are aiming to inoculate more than 600,000 children, with each requiring two vaccine doses. Turning to news closer to home now, Canadians spending the long weekend south of the border may have found their hotels surrounded by picket lines. Around 10,000 hotel workers in the U.S. walked off the job last night. The job action spanning 24 hotels in eight cities, including Seattle, San Francisco, Boston and Honolulu. Workers are demanding better pay and working conditions from Marriott, Hilton and Hyatt chains after contract negotiations broke down this weekend. The union warns more locations could see labor disruptions in the coming days. And that strike comes on Labor Day weekend, of course. Unionized workers across the United States and Canada are marking the occasion. The labor movement's annual holiday comes against a backdrop of high-profile labor disputes in recent months. Union leaders say there has been a resurgence in public support for striking workers, fueled by inflation and corporate greed. Kyle Benning has more. Labor Day Parade! The last 18 months have given organized unions plenty to celebrate. And in Toronto... Thousands, including the city's mayor, are out dedicating their stat holiday to those who laid the groundwork. We're working in uh, a Labor Day, for example, <laughs> you get a bit more. All of those we take for granted, but it's really the workers coming together through the union instead of struggling for it. And that struggle has been highly publicized. Data from Employment and Social Development Canada shows there have been more than 800 work stoppages from the start of 2023 to June 2024. While more than 90% of them have been resolved, unionized workers have flexed their muscles through strike votes and on picket lines. Ontario liquor store workers, airline employees and rail workers responding to post-pandemic inflation, which peaked above 8% in June 2022. We've never had, uh, you know, the kinds of gains that we've seen, whether it's, you know, new anti-scab legislation, whether it's the Sustainable Jobs Act. We've been making a lot of improvements for workers. The Prime Minister pointing to the passing of two worker-related policies through his deal with the NDP as proof of some of those improvements today, saying in a statement that these are important victories for Canadians, for families, for the middle class, and they wouldn't be possible without workers. It is a great time to be fighting for workers, but at the same time, workers are struggling with affordability issues, with housing issues. So really, as a union, we have to fight on all fronts to make sure that we're at, you know, getting improvements uh, across the spectrum. Those improvements could just be days away from being tested again, as some 5,400 Air Canada pilots inch closer to a strike that could send another round of labour shockwaves across the country. Kyle Benning. Global News, Toronto. Staffing shortages are being blamed for the closure of five hospital emergency rooms in British Columbia's interior this weekend. Most have now reopened, but health officials expect the problem to persist, part of a broader issue plaguing emergency services across Canada. Nithu Garcha reports. Staffing issues are cited as the reason why emergency rooms across B.C. are facing more closures, leaving many communities struggling with limited access to critical care. We're having revolving door closures happening in all of these communities uh, on an ongoing basis, and it's not been just this month or last month or this long weekend. It has been for years. We need to declare a state of emergency and we need to handle it um, as such. Over the long weekend, five hospital ERs in BC's interior were temporarily closed due to limited physician availability. In the month of August, BC's Interior Health and Northern Health closed emergency departments 54 times, according to data compiled by Global News. The province's health minister says it's doing everything it can to resolve the issue. This is a national problem 
and we're addressing it with, a, uh, with comprehensive short-term measures, but also measures to make it better in the long run. That's recruiting more doctors and nurses who are qualified to work in an emergency room. Hospital staff and patients, though, say it's not enough. We need to see bold reform. We need to reinvent, reimagine what we're going to do with our health care system because patching up with short-term band-aids is not the solution. A new report by the Canadian Institute for Health Information shows longer ER wait times reported across all provinces and territories. Between April of 2023 and March of 2024, the median stay for urgent cases rose to 4.1 hours, and for less severe cases, it reached 2.7 hours. It's a pretty devastating situation, and I'm quite worried. What could happen? As local officials in B.C. warn about the consequences of patients having to drive more than two hours for critical care, most ERs have reopened. The weekend's closure is just the latest reminder of a critical need for improvements across the health care system. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. A scary start to the school year. Coming up, Russia's new bombardment as students head back to class in Ukraine. A far-right party has won state elections in Germany for the first time since the Second World War. <laughs> Controversial leader of the Alternative for Germany party, Bjorn Hoka, called his party's win a historic success that proves Germans want change. Winning doesn't mean that party will lead the regional government, however. It did not win an outright majority, and other parties have said they won't form a coalition with the AFD. The far-right party, which has been designated as extremist by German intelligence and judicial officials, also came a close second in another state election. One of the top issues in that election was Germany's continued financial support for Ukraine, where today more than 40 Ukrainians were injured by Russian airstrikes pounding the city of Kharkiv, targeting civilian infrastructure, according to local officials. At least five children were among the wounded. As Nathaniel Dove reports, it all made for a frightening start to the school year on both sides of the Russian-Ukraine border. A heavy Russian attack killing dozens in Ukraine Monday. This woman says the explosions woke her six-year-old daughter, whose hands were shaking. It's her first day of school. The barrage of missiles comes as students return to class. Many are now underground, where parents hope they'll be safe as the war drags on. Russia is waging a total war against Ukraine, clearly to make sure Ukrainians concede. There's no battlefield advantage, this analyst says, to attacking civilians adding the Kremlin strikes are designed to break morale. Ukraine's attacks, on the other hand, like one that closed a Russian school, aim to bring the war to Russians. Striking Russia is militarily useful, that sometimes the best defense is a good offense. On Monday, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky urged the international community for more help, saying his country needs long-range weapons and permission to use them to strike deep in Russian territory. The Dutch Prime Minister announcing 200 million euros for infrastructure repairs. The Ukrainians understand that this constant pressure is what moves the needle, but of course they must be very frustrated at how painfully slow the needle is to move. Analysts tell Global News Ukraine getting the weapons means convincing the West Russia's threats are bluffs, like when it attacked Russia directly. They're hoping that kind of um, uh, using the Kursk success will be able to convince more and more. Vladimir Putin, while visiting Mongolia and violating a war crimes arrest warrant, says Kursk will fail. Both analysts say the war is not close to ending, which could mean more underground lessons and threatened students. Nathaniel Dove, Global News, Toronto. Troubling trend still ahead. Why Atlantic Canada's largest newspaper chain is laying off dozens of journalists. Welcome back. Stevie Cameron, a trailblazing investigative journalist who challenged some of the most powerful people in this country, has died. She was 80 years old. 
Cameron is known for her work investigating former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's involvement in a controversial contract to acquire Airbus jets. She also wrote two books on B.C. serial killer Robert Picton. Her friend and former colleague Jan Wong says Cameron was both tenacious and empathetic. And Wong says her loss comes at a time when Canada needs more investigative journalists to follow her formidable footsteps. She had an ethical and moral core. She had a righteous indignation. And so if you were a wrongdoer, Stevie was going to go after you. And uh, she was she was just so energetic and powerful. And she kept her eye on it. And she never gave up. She was tireless. We lose one of the most important um, pillars of democracy. We, we lose the holding to account of the powerful. And so it's it's very sad right now what's happening in journalism. There's a direct connection between your newspaper subscription being cancelled and the lack of, of good journalists. It's all connected. The loss of journalists is also being felt in Atlantic Canada this Labor Day. The region's largest news media company, Saltwire, is being consolidated into a larger chain. And with that comes layoffs for dozens of journalists with decades of experience. Heidi Petrachik reports. I never read digital. I don't want to read digital. Murray Rich is a rarity, one of the few people we could find who still buys newspapers. I look at a computer screen way too much. I don't need to be looking at it on the weekend. But statistics show most Canadians get their news online. And it's against that backdrop that Saltwire, the East Coast's largest media company, recently found itself unable to pay its bills. Now the company and its 26 newspapers have been bought by Toronto's Post Media Network for $1 million. 60 staff from newsrooms throughout Atlantic Canada have been laid off so far. There was a while where we weren't sure we were going to be bought at all. Uh, no jobs for anybody, so it's bittersweet in that way. But a shrinking local newsroom is tough to take in a province that celebrates Joseph Howe, a 19th century newspaper man and fierce advocate for a free and independent press. His statue next to the legislature, where there are now fewer reporters around to cover what happens inside. Who's covering the local news? Who's covering, you know, municipal politics? A concerning question for journalism professor Kim Kierens. If we don't have that information, how can we be a functioning democracy? Canada's newspaper industry is trying to make a comeback online, but as operating revenues have declined, so have the number of daily papers. A decade ago, there were 104 now they're 71. My hope for the future is that they can turn it around. Post Media's CEO has said the layoffs were necessary to create a more stable future and to prevent the total shutdown of the papers. I happen to think that government support of the news industry is vital going forward. A potentially contentious topic come federal election time, he says, given opposing views in the House of Commons. It's an existential moment uh, for Canadian journalism. And a moment of truth for newspapers now owned by Post Media in Atlantic Canada. Heidi Petrochik, Global News, Halifax. Golden Homecoming. Up next, a Canadian Olympic champion makes his first fan appearance. In Paris, Team Canada had its best day yet at the Paralympics. Leanne Taylor got the party started by winning the bronze medal in women's wheelchair triathlon. Austin Smeek kept the good times going by taking bronze in the men's T-34 100 meters. And to cap the day off, Nicholas Bennett won gold in the men's SB-14 100 meter breaststroke. That's Canada's first gold of these games and set a new world record. All of this leaves Canada with 11 medals after five days of competition. And just a few weeks before the Paralympics began, Canada's Philip Kinn made history of his own as the first man to win gold in Olympic breaking. He made his first public appearance since that victory in his hometown of Vancouver over the weekend. And as Alyssa Thibault reports, Kim is still trying to get used to his newfound fame. Two, three, cheers. Back on home soil and carrying the first ever Olympic gold medal in men's breaking. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. I don't wear this so often, so it's like funny to wear it when I do wear it. But uh, I mean, I, it's fun to like let people hold it and stuff. Phil Kim, or B-Boy Phil Wizard as he's known in competition, showed off some moves and met with fans Sunday. Taking selfies and signing autographs. 
really cool. It was a wonderful experience. Even those who weren't lucky enough to meet him were just happy to see him. Like he made eye contact really cool. <laughs> the 27-year-old from Vancouver won all three rounds in Paris to secure gold, making history in the process. It's kind of surreal to me. I get recognized on the street and stuff. It's not something that I'm used to, uh, but I'm very appreciative and everyone's been very, very nice. And he could be the only men's Olympic breaking champ for the foreseeable future. The sport isn't included for the Los Angeles Games in 2028, and so far it's not part of the Brisbane 2032 Games either. Give it up for Austin! <laughs> but he's inspiring a whole new generation, some who know a few moves already, and others who are just learning for the first time. <laughs> You know, I have a lot of people coming up to me saying they've put their kids into breaking and that was the goal kind of going into this. So uh, hopefully it just grows and grows and gets bigger and better. <laughs> Alyssa Tebow, Global News, Vancouver. And that is Global National for this Monday night. I'm Jeff Semple. As we say goodbye to the dog days of summer, tonight's Your Canada is the annual Dog Swims event happening across the country. It's the last day of the year that outdoor pools are open in many Canadian cities. And in Edmonton, it's for a good cause. Or should I say, good paws. Sorry, dad joke. The entry fee in Edmonton is a donation to help support the Second Chance Animal Rescue Society. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.